Welcome back, everybody. I hope everyone is back from their short break and let's jump right into our forum. So, for our forum today, we have with us Mr. Faisal, who spoke on sustainability through veganism just now, and also Ms. Margo and Mr. Rajesh Shazrin to bring us perspective from both a researcher and an SST consultant. Without further ado, let's have, have a dynamic and engaging forum. Right. Thank you very much, Aynan, for the introduction. So for today's forum, we'll be focusing more on some of the challenges dealing with climate change, also so some initiatives that we can do as individuals to help with climate change. So let's just jump into our forum, um, starting with our first question. This first question is actually addressed to Mr. Faisal. Just now seeing your slide, it was surprising for me. What I felt was that it was quite surprising to see how much more accepting the world has become towards um, a vegan lifestyle because maybe here in Malaysia, there's not that much yet. So during, and this is one of the example of the world becoming more accepting is that during the recent conference of parties for the UN Climate Change Conference, they started, I believe they started providing vegan food, right? With sustainable packaging. So if you can answer this in two minutes, um, while researching this talk, were there any facts or statistics that surprised you All right, sure. So thank you very much, uh, June, and uh, welcome back, everyone. So yes, I think uh, for this uh, particular conference, uh, for those of you who are not aware, every year uh, the United Nations hosts a conference in called the Conference of Parties, uh, which is to discuss on matters of climate change. And this is a conference between uh, all the nations in the United Nations and normally involves the top leaders. Uh, even uh, this time around, the, in Malaysia, even the Agung also went to the conference in Dubai, uh, together with the top ministers, and even the prime minister also was there uh, in Dubai at this conference. Okay, And um, it is quite significant this time around because this conference was, for the first time ever, being held at, in the Middle East, in Dubai and being in one of the largest uh, producers of oil and gas. As you uh, are now understanding better, that oil and gas industry is the largest contributor of greenhouse gases and towards the climate change and all that. And so it is quite a significant event to have it at the Dubai uh, in UAE, right? Uh, on top of that, so another agenda that was brought forth was the food agenda. Because I think in every climate change conference, all that, the fossil food industry has always been uh, the focal point and one of the main agendas for climate change. However, people often overlook this uh, food sector. All right, And I think that's where ProVeg and many other organizations, even like Greenpeace to some degree and some other organizations out there, look into how we can shift this uh, food uh, transformation. And so what ProVeg does is try to uh, demonstrate that anybody can go plant-based quite easily, and it's all a matter of uh, decision and um, actually taking steps and actions to go through it. Okay, uh, Because, uh, and this time around in the COP conference, about two thirds of the food served there was plant based, all right. And um, although I was not there personally, I heard everyone went for the plant based foods, and they always ran out. Okay, and of course, one of the key things that uh, makes it more uh, attractive is that you just sometimes need to make it available. The first thing that often that we face uh, challenges here, even in Malaysia. Sometimes in the big events, major events, even in university events, just that the availability or the accessibility of having even vegetarian or plant-based options is a problem in itself, all right? So I would encourage you to maybe at least start with that. Start with your own community events or university events to ensure that you have some plant-based options. Or if better still, if you can make it the default option, all right? 
So for instance, I believe in some of the Isaac programs that we have been doing in uh, the Klang Valley area, we've been encouraging some of these events to be fully plant-based. And why, why is that? So that it's more inclusive. Everyone can enjoy it. Uh, it doesn't matter whatever uh, dietary background, uh, dietary uh, choice that you have or you have any religious restrictions or so forth. Normally, and uh, which is the case, uh, plant-based diets are actually universal. And we call it a universal diet. It's a global diet everybody can adopt. And I believe that's the change that we see uh, in Malaysia alone. Statistically, uh, the vegan uh, diet population has been increasing steadily. Uh, people are adopting more plant-based. And in fact, surprisingly, you may not know this for those who are not vegetarian, but actually Malaysia is regarded one of the top three most vegetarian-friendly countries in the world. <laughs> Only due to the fact that we have so much vegetarian restaurants and F&Bs uh, per capita. Okay, So I think we are spot for choice. I'm not sure the situation in Kuching in particular, but definitely in Semenanjung, there's so many choices. And it's just up to us where we want to get those uh, options. Uh, and we can see a trend nowadays in the Klang Valley at least, all the other non-vegetarian places also having at least a vegetarian option here and there. Right? So I think as more and more people are more aware of the need for it, for health reasons or environmental reasons, we see more and more people adopting it. And the more that we learn, the more that we want it. Yeah, thank you. Right, right. So like one of the changes you see is that more emphasis on vegan, more emphasis on our decision, right? So um, let's move on to our second question, which is that was uh, one of the things that we changed in the, from the past, right? Last time you said that we were focusing more on fossil fuel. Now we focus on also our diet. So this question is towards um, Mr. Rajashastri and Ms. Margo. So what has changed in our approach in combating climate change. So since it has been a hot topic for a while, so what has changed our approach? And perhaps if you can answer that in like three minutes. We can start with Mr. Sure, I'm happy to go first, thanks. Um, so I, I work for Greenpeace, so this is an environmental NGO um, working on environmental destruction. And I can speak a bit about how organizations, I think, are shifting the way we address this issue. One of the biggest things that I think has changed is the recognition of intersectionality. So climate change isn't just a separate issue anymore. Uh, we realize more and more that it's really interconnected with all of the a lot of the other problems that we're facing in the world like social justice issues, poverty, discrimination, colonialism, patriarchy, basically all kinds of injustice. And it's it's helpful to to acknowledge this, to recognize that when when we when when we say we need to work on climate change, everybody needs to work on it. It's not just the job of environmentalists or climate scientists. It's really something that is critical for everyone to get involved in. And I think uh, in addition to that, uh, the, the idea that we need global collaboration is another part of it. It, it can't just be you know, one person or one country that can fix it. Um, of course, that doesn't mean we shouldn't feel empowered. We all have to play a part, um, but it's uh, recognizing this global system that um, is causing it, I think is really important. And the, the other thing I would say is that now, today, we have a lot more knowledge. So it's no longer a question of if climate change is happening, but it's more a question of how do we address it and what do we need to do now? And so we've have, we've, that's positive in the sense that um, there still is climate denial, unfortunately, everywhere, but a lot more people ha are not only acknowledging it, but even seeing it in their daily lives. As Mr. Faisal showed before, we are seeing extreme weather events, more flooding, more rain, more deforest wildfires and drought, um, which 
all contributes to, we're all starting to see impacts of that. In Malaysia, we have haze and air pollution that's also linked to, you know, forest fires and things like that. So, so it's something that I think um, we, it's become more urgent. And so we can hopefully build a bigger movement that way. That's the, the difference I see today. So I'll stop there, pass it over. Uh, thank you, Margo, for setting the scene. I think we have similar thoughts. I think one of the biggest changes that that uh, is uh, overarching all the other changes is that uh, more and more people are acknowledging the problem of climate change. And I think uh, because of that, it, it's uh, it's uh, gotten enough attention and uh, it's it's being catalyzed by the multiple channels that are available right now when, when you know, uh, communication is decentralized to the through the access to social media, and I think what I what I also want to change what I also want to say is that uh, through this we can see uh, different parties or, or different entities playing different roles. For example, uh, you know if you look at drivers, the governments are driving this through uh, new re legislations. For example, we see a lot of updates right now happening live on on what's happening in Europe through the implementation of the carbon border adjustment mechanisms, which looks into uh, putting it in law on how we how we we are required to to reduce our emissions because uh, your carbon will be taxed. So CBAM is something that CBAM is something that is not just affecting the businesses in Europe, and this is affecting the businesses everywhere. And I think for those of you in Kuching, you are aware of your the new climate change legislations that are coming up and and you know, I, I applaud Sarawak government for, for being the first state in the country to, to have a climate change law, which actually explicitly mentioned uh, that businesses need to disclose their carbon emissions. Then of course you have uh, the, the next driver coming from the businesses through the uh, requirements by Bursa, which actually requires public listed company to report their sustainability performance through ESG reports or sustainability reports and also, uh, this has actually uh, has a, a, a created an overflow effect, you know, because big organizations, public listed companies tend to be big. For example, if you talk about Petronas, they have 4,000 vendors. And, and you know, uh, what about Tanaga National? What about Telecom Malaysia, Maybank and all this? So eventually, uh, having ESG on board, even though some people say ESG is just a scam, it's a greenwashing opportunity, but I feel that, you know, I have I have uh, a little bit of faith and trust in the in in the system, and I hope that this will be something that is uh, 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 going to have a, a lot of uh, input and a lot of uh, role to play in in driving change. And of course, where we come in as individuals, uh, you know that there's a a, a contribution towards the uh, you know the consumer uh, expectations where businesses are expected to be multiple in how they operate, but. Uh, the change for the individual needs to come from uh, the root. We need to look uh, at the fundamentals to see how behavioral change, cultural change, we need to redefine what we mean by when we say comfortable, what we mean when we say good life. And of course, uh, Faisal mentioned it a couple of times uh, over just now as well. Uh, what does it mean when you say it's delicious? What do you mean when you say it's good? It's good, you know? So we, we need to look at the value of taste. So a lot of people mentioning maybe when Pfizer was showing the statistics about the cows and and you know everyone wants the stakes and 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 you know it's something that uh, we have to put in our minds on 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 what are we foregoing when when we're saying you know I'm I, I'm I'm no longer eating meat because of this and I I'm conscious because of that I haven't had meat for ten years and and I I don't think I ever will anymore and I I don't think I'm losing anything. So I don't think I'm losing out. So I'm clear to what a good life means. So I think this is what I think we need to communicate to everyone. If if we get good communicators to actually explain it, people like Greta Thunberg just now, she she told a wonderful story. Maybe I'm, I'm too technical when I'm saying it, so I'm not man for the job, but I think we need to communicate it better. So this this is not the change that's happening yet, but it's, it's the change that needs to happen. Thank you. Right, right. So... To summarize a little bit, Ms. Margo talk about um right now we have more of a understanding of how all the problems are connected together. And with that, 
we are able to change, we are able to have more impact in changing everything and changing um not just the fuel industry, but like everybody um move towards the change together. And also Mr. Rajeshastrin talked about how we also need to change our view in terms of like do I go vegan? Or like what's the reason do I want to go vegan and how would it impact and to have that be communicated very properly, right? So which comes to the next question, which is we all these change probably comes with its own challenges and downsides that might be considered, right? One of the even one of our participants asked that if we all were to be 100% vegan, won't there be no markets for production of meat at all? And how would that affect the ecosystem? How would that affect the economy? Perhaps this is a question for um, Mrs. Shastrin because you work more on creating these guidelines and policies on ESG. So if you could answer that in four minutes. Okay, four minutes. <laughs> you, you're putting a limit on this. Well, I think the just to follow up on, on what I've said just now, coincidentally, there's a, 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 a follow through to your questions. Uh, I think the biggest challenge uh, will be the change that will be required, right? So people acknowledge that we, we need to, to address this problem at a uh, fundamental level. You, you need to be looking at uh, behavioral and cultural changes, as I mentioned. We need to reevaluate what our values are. We need to we need to look into how we live, you know, how we live, how we eat, how we manufacture, how we build. And uh, I think uh, this is something that we need to look at, uh, at at many levels. The government need to redefine this. And, and you know, I think at an individual level, we, we also need to get involved. I think the, the people who are communicating this idea need to, to, to incorporate uh, and, 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 you know, I, I think the change cannot just be natural anymore. If if we are putting, uh, as I mentioned just now, if we are putting steroids into Mother Nature by wanting our food to grow faster, you know, we want our animals to grow faster just because we want to eat them. Uh, chicken life is 60 days. How can something live for 60 days? You know, you're, you're worse than the witch that that uh, is, is trying to eat Hansel and Gretel. I think, you know, we are, we need to, make people realize that. So that, that's one of the challenges. Behavioral and cultural changes uh, needs to be incorporated into our risk assessment. It needs to be incorporated into the decision-making because a lot of people are talking about uh, financial resources that are required. People were talking about how expensive cars are, are going to be, electric cars are going to be. People are talking about uh, the technology part. You know, what do we do with the batteries afterward? You know, what do we do with spent uh, solar panels? But the fact is, Technology is catching up quite quickly, and how we are going to address this technology by by the requirements of change through our how we behave, through how we live. This is something that uh, needs to be addressed. I think that's one of the major challenges. Now, the other challenge is the, you know, there are people who are blessed than than uh, more blessed than other people. So we need to slowly or or rather aggressively address the just transition part. So this is what I think uh, a fact that was overlooked, the, word, the meaning of the word just. What would it mean to the people who could not afford? I think there was a comment in the chat just now talking about how uh, uh, vegetarian food are being uh, upscaled, are, are being upscaled. You know, they are, it's more expensive than normal food. So I think this is where we should address uh, who will be the most uh, vulnerable and the most affected by these changes that are going to happen. No doubt, uh, things are going to be expensive at first. If we realize now the car, the electric car is the same. If you realize, I don't know if you are old enough, but uh, you know, those smartphones came out uh, not being accessible to everyone. You know, we used to, to we were used to having those, those uh, not so smartphones. Is that, is that what you call it? <laughs> right. The, 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 the common phones without the email, without the internet. And, and, you know, as time passed, you could get, you know, I, I think it's 10% or maybe 20% of what, what it cost uh, when it first came out, you know. So so the just transition is another important part. And I, 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 I think the last part is communication. I mentioned this already early in my response, but uh, I just want to wanna also highlight how, how important uh, is, uh, is it to have uh, these messages to be communicated in a way that the stakeholders would digest. Because if I speak in a way that I speak, you, you might not find it interesting enough. I, I, I don't know what FRFR FR is, for example, just now. So, 
Yeah, you need people who speak the language so that the the proper generations will, will be able to digest. So we need involvement, basically. We need involvement. So uh, we need Maria to tell the FRFR story so the your community will accept it. And I can address those, uh, the Margos and the Faisal. <laughs> I'm putting us in, in one group. You know, so so uh, uh, I think this is this is the, the the change that's required, and also the challenge where we need to put uh, people with uh, various skills. We need to acknowledge that communication is something that uh, that is required. So we need experts from all level of uh, uh, you know age. Uh, we need representation. We need diversity so that communication can happen. Uh, I'm all over the place. I'm so sorry, but I think that uh, that addresses your your question. Yeah, that definitely addresses my question. You talked about how one challenge is reevaluating our values, another one's financially, but technology has been helping to reduce the prices of green technology and the transition the and how the, this transition would impact those who can't afford it, right? So I wonder very quickly, could you explain um could you let me know how would you be able to reconcile the pros and cons of this kind of transition? Definitely there will be some people that's against it because this transition probably cost them to, maybe it's their business, maybe it's cost them more money, maybe they don't want it in terms of attitude. Like So could you explain about that a little bit? I think uh, we can go back to the communication and the behavioral change. You know, we we, we have no problems. I, 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 I think this is a story that everyone can remember. We are comfortable and proud to refuse plastic straws because we remember that video of the straw going up the turtle's nose, right? So that's something that we need. We need that kind of change for people to say, oh no, I feel insulted when I'm offered plastic bags. I feel insulted when I'm served in styrofoam cups. So we need that change. We need that change. So yeah, people still use plastic straws though. <laughs> yeah, People still do. We, we need the change to happen. So... Uh, just to also address the just transition part, I think this is where the government needs to come in. Uh, a lot of people that are, this is unsubstantiated claim, but uh, I think it's it's a warrant. Uh, it, it makes a little bit of sense. A lot of people who are enjoying the subsidies, who are enjoying the perks, are actually people who don't need them. So I think this needs to be looked at. It needs to be streamlined so that we can have a proper just transition, you know, so uh, I, I was sitting in, in, a, in an event uh, yes, day before yesterday with uh, environmental NGOs. I said, you know, we are sitting here comfortably in an air-conditioned room and everyone are hypocrites, including myself. I said, because in Malaysia, we have this problem where our energy, our energy is being, is heavily subsidized. Our, our petrol, our fuel is heavily subsidized. You know, we're paying two ringgit five cents per litre for petrol for around 95 in Europe, it would cost the equivalent of seven to nine ringgit. And we are we are heavily subsidized on our water as well. So all our resources. So I told all the NGOs, we need to communicate this in a, in a proper way. Otherwise, we're all hypocrites. Why don't you pick it for increasing the petrol prices? You're also selective as much as the politicians and the government. So again, communication. Communication is required. And, and I think we need to look and, and actually break down the problems and see which parts we can solve together. I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but yeah, that, that's what's happening. Yeah. I, I think that that's a really good point. The comparison with the plastic, I think that really, for me, that kind of, oh, I, I see what you mean now. It really has like an impact of how I would look at plastic and how I would um, make my choices in the future. So I noticed that a lot of the Q&A section, they were asking like, so what can we do? You know, What can we do as individuals to, because a lot of people want to help with this cause, with this climate change. So this question is for Ms. Margo and Mr. Faisal. Perhaps what is, what as individuals, what role do we play to combat climate change? Like maybe in our decision, in maybe joining, certain, supporting certain initiatives um, or like some supporting certain initiatives, certain programs. Would you guys be able to answer that in around three minutes? Margo, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, so this is a great question, and I and I think it I can build on what Mr. Raja was just saying. Uh, I think the first thing is we need to be the change that we want to see in the world, 
and we need to trust that our behavior matters. Um, everybody always says, you know, uh, my one one straw doesn't matter. But if everybody says that, you know, we have eight billion straws, right? So everybody needs to live the the values that we want to see. And also, it can be hard because we might feel like we're just one person. Um, but we need to also recognize that there is a ripple effect when one person starts doing something and everybody around them sees it that has an impact we might not even realize but that does matter and that is how change happens and the other thing i would say is um we have power the the people have a lot more power than we think so uh two things that i think are really important one is of course holding our politicians accountable because the government won't do anything that we don't demand so voting is critical but even if you think voting maybe won't make so much of a difference, you can organize on a local scale in your community and you can pressure your local politicians and there can be a lot of change that can that can also have a ripple effect. So it's really important to get involved politically uh, and with community groups as well. And I also like to tell people there's multiple ways to vote. You can vote uh, in an election, but you can also vote with your wallet. And of course, uh, there's the, the question of just transition is, is a big one that needs to be addressed. And not everybody has the money and the means to do everything. But, we, but like Greta said in the video, almost everyone can do something. And we all need to start. And we can, we can start by choosing to, to look for products that maybe are just a little bit different from the way we do it today. A lot of what we do is just habit because we've grown up learning that this is normal. But it's what we really need to do is start questioning the, the system that we're in and seeing where we can make small changes, because more and more there are options for us to shop low zero waste with no plastic, um, eat more plant based foods, grow our own foods, compost, uh, repair and reuse things instead of throwing them away and just buying a new one because it's really cheap on Shopee or Lazada. So there's things that we can all do in a little way. And when you talk about it uh, with your community, your family, your friends, even if you don't talk about it, I think I believe that just showing people that other another way of living is possible can have a huge impact. So that's where I would start. Over. Yeah, I think that's a lovely way uh, to put it, uh, Margot. And uh, if the Isaacers have any chance to come down to Kuala Lumpur or Pataling Jaya, you should visit Margot's place. Actually, she has a public space uh, called Gaia HQ. And if you want to see sustainability in action, then definitely you should check them out. They do a lot of upcycling. So what they do is actually, I'm not sure what the term is called, Margot. Maybe you can help me here. I think they call it like, a, it's like dumpster, <laughs> dumpster uh, uh, scavengers. Uh, but basically, they take a lot of these uh, dumped furnitures. You know how in these condos and all that, people just leave old furniture. And sometimes they're most often very usable. They're just like maybe a scratch here or there or has a broken leg or whatever. Or they just wanted to change to a new furniture. And so they discarded this one. And so it's just there and up for the taking. So what Margot does with his partner is, uh, they take these furniture and they use it in their facility and uh, share it with everyone. I think it's a great concept. And I think you can do that too in your campus. All right. I've heard of uh, some campuses, what they do, they set up their own uh, carousel. I think uh, you've heard of carousel, right? Carousel is like a secondhand uh, pre-loved item marketplace. So you can set up your own marketplace. And I think uh, if you look on Facebook groups, there's a few Facebook groups uh, that is doing this in communities and I believe you can set up your own community and do the same uh, in Kuching. I hope you don't hear the other environmental noise. Okay, so uh, and um, yeah, and uh, for for the other part of it is uh, like what I was sharing earlier. Um, if you want to make changes in terms of going plant-based and all that, um, of course it starts with yourself, starts with me, starts with you. And um, I would highly encourage you to find a few people to do it together. All right. It makes a lot of difference when you do it together than doing it alone. 
so you're not um, lonely and uh, stressed out and um, uh, going through all the challenges yourself, but you have a buddy to work uh, and to go alongside with, and you can have fun with it. You can explore new options, new varieties, cook at home, cook at the dorms or whatever. And then uh, eventually, I would I I would love to see someday that you make a change like how other European universities are doing in um, trying to create more options on the cafe in the cafeterias on campus and all that. Right, but it starts with you. If you don't demand it or you don't ask for it, the administration, the university management won't know that there is a need for it. Right, so you need to make it clear. You need to use your student bodies. You need to use your any connections that you have. And I believe Isaac is in a good position to do that. And yeah, this is a great start with Echo. Thank you. Thank you, Margo and Faisal. That was um very well said. I'd say um, holding politicians accountable. Um, voting with your wallet, little actions that we can take to have a ripple effect on the society and on other people's actions as well. Well, this last question I would like to ask is that, what do you um considering what all of you have talked about? How optimistic are you about global, um about our ability to address and reduce carbon footprint? in the upcoming years, right? So this is a question for everybody. You can take turns answering. Faiza, you can go first. I'm going first all the time. <laughs> all right. So the question was, uh, how do we uh, reduce our common footprint, right? How optimistic are you that we are able how to optimistic, achieve yeah. that? Yeah. I think I'm optimistic, especially with the younger generation. And I think this is where um, the younger generation needs to make that change and, and it, it needs to start with us, all right? Because if you don't take control, we're going to be in trouble because uh, the older generation, unfortunately, they only have so many years and uh, less of, uh, I would say, at stake, all right? But you guys are the ones who are going to be living through this the next few decades, all right? So it's you who have more at stake you need to take control. You need to understand that um, everybody can play a role. Don't doesn't matter how small or how big. All right. Of course, the things that we were talking about, challenging politicians and all that, those maybe need people with a little bit of guts, lah. All right. And not everybody can do that. We understand that. But if you are that kind of person and you can uh, group together and make something happen, then great. But if not. Do your own little bit, all right? Do your little bit, uh, do your zero waste, do your thing, go plugging at the beach and all that. So everything and every contribution counts, all right? Uh, as Margot was saying just now, it's a ripple effect. You may not notice it alone, but think about it. If one in 10 of you does it globally, it still makes a difference, all right? Uh, as a collective, we do make a difference. And I think this is where, if you can find a community that, does this together, it does make a difference and you'll be more encouraged to do more and find your own gang. Lah. Uh, if you like plugging, find a plugging gang. I'm sure there's one in Sarawak or any, there's lots now, tons of them in uh, uh, Malaysia. Maybe Margot can talk about it later. I think she's in a few, All right? And I believe uh, there's a group I know that does uh, leave no trace. Whenever they go hiking or camping in a forest, they make sure that they don't leave any garbage and they even pick up other people's garbage at the same time. So yeah, you can have fun, do all these activities at the same time, clean up after yourself, right? At the very least you do that. If, if you want to get even more aggressive and all that, then yeah, I mean, that's why it's very important. We need to educate ourselves more and more. And I hope everyone can do uh, look into those documentaries that I suggested and, uh, and dive deeper into all this information and issues and take action. I think that's all. Um, you just need to take action. And I'm optimistic if everyone does their part and everyone plays their role, we can make a difference. Maybe Margo? Yeah, since Raja wants to be last. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think this question of the how optimistic are we is, is a difficult one because uh, it feels it can feel really overwhelming, this issue, and it's scary. And um, sometimes people's reaction is to 
not think about it or try to deny it because it's too hard to figure out how, how to address and we feel a bit helpless. So I think this is, um, it's really important to emphasize this. Uh, the one thing that keeps me optimistic is that I know that we have all of the solutions. Technology is increasing a lot. We already know what we need to do. We know that how we need to transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. We know that we need to stop eating meat and industrial animal agriculture. Um, there are things like that that we, we have the answers for and it's now a question of why aren't we doing it? And this I think is really a failure in our leadership in from politicians and CEOs and any kind of leaders, even sometimes religious leaders. Uh, we need our leaders to be doing something. So that's, I think, the, the big challenge. And we just, we need to be pushing and pushing and demanding for these things to happen. But remembering that there are solutions. And I, I think often it's money that's stopping that transition from happen, happening naturally. Um, I, I like to give an example of uh, what happened during COVID to show us that if, a, if the government wanted to address these issues, they could. If you remember the communication and the urgency of addressing COVID, the whole country reacted and got together and immediately changed our behavior. And we don't want to have to wait until us to change our behavior. So we need to start doing it sooner. We need to do it more. We, if, we, if we wait, then we won't have time to transition. Uh, it, will, it will be too late. And we know that there are really catastrophic tipping points coming up. Tipping points meaning points when uh, there will be a really devastating domino effect after it's it's a bit too late to, to stop things from happening, like the melting of certain um, you know ice sheets and permafrost and things like that. But um, we don't wanna reach those points. So today I think it's more about just everyone in every space that we have you know, every company is responsible for doing something. It's not just, you know, some companies. It's everyone. And it's every politician is responsible. It's not just the minister of environment. It's, you know, uh, I think we need to recognize that it's, it's everyone's job to to speak about it and do something. Um, but yeah, just I think I, I just would, would end with just reminding people that we do have the solutions. It's just a question of making sure we use them. So I, I, I had a, I have a short note uh, on, on my talking points and I, I, I was seeing them being crossed one by one as Marco, as Marco spoke. <laughs> but anyway, uh, just to answer the question, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm op optimistic towards uh, the, glo the global community's ability to address the issue of, of, of climate change and, and you know reducing carbon footprint. I'm seeing things that are happening uh, at the government level, I'm seeing things that are happening at the community level, I'm seeing uh, the community change, the behavior change. And uh, I, I do want to also point out, uh, just to, to echo what Marco have said, I think people need to realize we, we have the people and, and we do have various uh, sources for money and other resources as well. You know, uh, we do have means of, of, of legislation. We do have frameworks to support the, the, the activities towards addressing uh, carbon footprints. And of course, uh, technology is evolving. So I think uh, people who are questioning, people who are talking about or arguing about uh, uh, what to do with the batteries, uh, you know, for, for EVs after they, they are no longer usable, I think this is slowly being uh, uh, something that is, uh, uh, did, did you read on the matter or, or are you following up closely on the developments? Because circular economy is something that, that people are, are, are putting a lot of effort and putting a lot of attention on right now. I, I don't think anything that is worth anything is going to the landfills. They are, they are mining those, those ways. They are urban mining those ways right now that, that, you know, uh, Chances are anything that's going to the landfill are, are probably things that that can decompose and and give them a uh, biogas. So so yeah, technology is developing. I think what we need now is to to just the critical mass. We need more people on board. We need more people who feel the same 
uh, about uh, uh, the importance and the urgency of, of addressing climate issue. Uh, we need that critical mass. And I hope, I hope, I just want to end with, with a story. You know, I hope uh, uh, as, as things that move along, you know, the, the same conversation be having to, to have the different kind of spirit, the different kind of value. Let's just take plastic, something that we all can remember. You know, it, it, it started with a, a statement of, of, of uh, displeasure and, and, you know, to make it like a hassle. Oh, that shop doesn't sell plastic. But right now, the same statement, that shop doesn't, doesn't have plastic. Please remember to bring uh, your own shopping bag. We are at that point. We are shifting. I think we are at that point where we are neutral about it, right? We are, so I, I hope soon we can transition ourselves to the third one. Are you crazy that shop gives plastic? You know, so that's what we want. You know, we want to make that decision. Are you crazy that shop gives straws? You. You know, we want people to talk like that. So I think uh, uh, that that's uh, that's when I will be really optimistic. But I see it and the trend is moving. So nobody nobody complains that shop uh, doesn't give you those tapau packs anymore. Nobody complains that shops don't give uh, plastic bags anymore. So we're at the neutral level right now. So uh, yeah, so plastic sort of feel so outdated, <laughs> right? So so we want we want to be shifting. I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much, June. Uh, it was a pleasure. Mr. Faisal, do you have yeah. something to say? I think, uh, echoing to that, I think I love the phrase that uh, Raja was saying just now. Critical mass is a key point here. And I think it is a key for any movement, right? Be it the plastic straw movement or the no plastic, zero waste. Um, recycling even hasn't come to that critical mass yet, I believe, in Malaysia. I'm not sure how the situation is in Sarawak and Sabah, uh, but definitely in Peninsula, it's far from ideal yet. Uh, but yeah, we need to start somewhere, even in the plant-based movement, and adopting plant-based is also critical and needed. In fact, in some reports and studies, according to the IPCC, which is uh, the scientist for the COP, uh, who does reports on climate change and all that, they even said, if we do everything else, addressing climate change on transportation, on industries, on the power generation and renewables, but do not look at the food system and the food transformation, we will still fail to mitigate the two degrees Celsius targets. All right. So I think it's very important that everyone plays a role. Everyone does their part and understands that everyone needs to be involved with this together. Right. Yeah, I think Raja wants to add on something. Yeah, you you just spark something. So I I I think uh I I want to give like uh, not normally you 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 don't read reviews anymore, right? You you don't read those uh paid paid kind of advertisements reviews anymore. So I, I just want to give my my personal experience. I I mentioned that uh I I'm already this is my tenth year as a vegetarian. I don't eat animals, and I just want to want to tell everyone I'm I'm not skinny. I'm not malnourished. And I'm happier. I think if, if anything, that, that brings a psychological uh, graduation in my mind. I'm more conscious about what I put in my body. And I don't just not eat animals. I don't wear them as well. So I've given up, uh, you know, I've given up leather wallets, belt, shoes. I, I go everywhere in, 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 my, in my trusty uh, uh, sport shoes. And, and I think it's, it's good for me. I'm, I'm, I'm so comfortable with my life right now. And I... I I've come to the acceptance of, you know, this is the cultural change part. If I'm going to see the minister and I'm wearing my New Balance running shoes, I, I feel that that's not an insult. I'm not disrespecting him. This is my life and I'm not going to put on some fancy leather shoes just because, uh, you know, that, that, that should not be the value anymore. So this is, this is what I think uh, we, can, we can talk about. It doesn't have to be hard science, you know, talking about uh, or where the atoms are moving, talking about, you know, how, how the carbon is going in and out. No, this is something that we can do. You know, I'm, I, when I bought my, my, my Toyota, my, my Toyota Vios, I don't drive an EV, sorry, Faisal. <laughs> when I bought the Toyota Vios, the first question that I asked was, does it come in not leather seats? So... That that was my 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 decision, and and I think that this is something that we can do as individuals as, as well. Yeah. 
So yeah, I did. Sorry, it's Farida to add on again. I, I I don't want to be the last because so someone please say something. I, I... <laughs> it's okay. Um, I have one last question. Even though we are running a little bit down on time, but um, this is more like a call to action to all of our participants. I see that a lot of people really would like to do something. Really would like to be part of maybe like the movement. You say part of the critical mass to have a change. So maybe this last question will be for Miss Margot. So what are some initiatives? That or something they can search to to be con to contribute to learn more about how they can impact uh, climate change. Great question. Uh, so working for Greenpeace, of course, as an environmental NGO, we love support and volunteers and anyone that wants to contribute. You can volunteer with Greenpeace, uh, but there's also lots of organizations and, like I mentioned. Getting involved in your local community is, is really empowering and exciting. And I don't know what's going on in Kuching, so I would just encourage you to go look, but there are other groups out, even because Greenpeace were not as active there, but um, you can also you know, start, start up your own chapter of certain things. So if you wanted to, for example, become a volunteer with Greenpeace and you want to start a local initiative in your community, that's the thing we would love to support. Uh, but there's other groups like Zero Waste Malaysia, there's groups doing beach cleanups, reef check, um, project waste. You can look for groups like this. There's, there's, when you start looking, you'll see that there's actually a lot more people and it's really exciting to get involved with like-minded people that are um, interested in these things. So yeah, I would just encourage everyone to, um, you know, search for NGOs and local groups doing things. And uh, feel free to also contact me if you're looking to connect and uh, get it, get more involved. Thank you very much to all of our panelists today. Um, wonderful perspective, very passionate, as you can see from how they try to fight away each other to speak more. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, we don't have time to address all of the Q&A questions, but I'll, later I'll, I'll write it all down and forward it to our panelists. So, hopefully, they can... Um, and then I'll reply the messages. I'll, I'll, reply, I'll forward their answers to a Telegram group later. And um, if you'd like to follow them on LinkedIn, if you'd like to get to know them a little bit more, here's their LinkedIn page. Um, this will also be sent in the Telegram group, so we don't need to screenshot this. And, well, let's move on to our next 